spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thrust unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word of truth. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, where we continue our study at the end of the verse. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the word of God using rebound if necessary, which is the confession of all known sin, according to 1 John 1, 9, uh, uh, claiming the promise that God will forgive the sin which is confessed to him. Therefore, you will be taught by God the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, that you have given to us the infallible, inerrant word in the original, and that we have the privilege of studying it today, and have the power of God, the Holy Spirit, to communicate truth to us, that we may glorify God the Son as we apply the word of God to our lives. For we realize that while we cannot add to his glory, our lives can become windows through which the glory of God be very clearly seen. That's our desire, and to that end I commit each one in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue our study in Galatians chapter 1, we encourage those who are watching by television or listening by radio to write for the first volume of our commentary series on Galatians. It contains an, uh, the introduction to the book and an exegesis of Galatians 1, through Galatians 1.10. And it is available without charge. There's no, no one will call on you. We don't have a visitation program. It's just available to you, uh, the Word of God, uh, as uh, it is taught here uh, in our class. All right, we have then at uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, and we have seen that Paul has laid the twofold foundation for what he's going to deal with with the church at Galatia. On his authority... And we'll be dealing with that once again when we come to chapter 1, verse 11, where Paul has to vindicate his apostleship again to point out uh, that he has the right uh, to correct them when they're wrong. And uh, the second thing uh, behind apostolic authority is in verse, uh, verse 3 to 5 uh, in the first part of the, the chapter, and that is the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ died for all sin, for all men, for all time, and nothing left for man to do. Nothing can be added to the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that will become the basic uh, 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 content of the second part of the book of Galatians. Now we are uh, going to the, to the problem. In ch chapter 1, verse 6, uh, we would expect to find a commendation uh, of the uh, Galatians, which is usually the uh, pathway that Paul takes, but not in this case. Paul is so exercised and so angered by what has happened after that, that he goes right into the problem. And he says in the corrected, expanded doctrinal translation, which we have just completed up to the, to the end of the verse, I'm absolutely amazed that you so readily, so rashly are defecting from the one who called you by the grace of Christ. There are two sides of the responsibility. One is the fact that there are false teachers who are coming around. We're going to be dealing with their, 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 uh, their message. That's what's coming up here. But it is always, not, it is always the responsibility of the individual believer uh, to know uh, what he believes and to uh, be ready to give to every man that asks him a reason for the hope that is within him. And the believer is responsible for defecting. Uh, you cannot uh, say, I, Satan, deceive me. You walk in with eyes wide open. And so Paul is amazed that these people, from the source of their own free will and volition, made decisions to follow uh, the uh, false teachers. Now, what is it that uh, they are, uh, that happens to them? He says, you are, you are uh, deserting the one who called you to 
And then we have, uh, there were two, uh, I'm going to, and I'm going to go back here to the King James Version uh, for the sake of helping you to understand what he's talking about. And it says in the last part of verse 6 and the first part of verse 7, to another gospel, which is not another. Which sounds rather enigmatic, but it isn't when you understand the original language. In the Greek, there are two words for another, and uh, the two different meanings. The wor first time it's used in this context, it is this word, H-E-T-E-R-O-S, heteros. Heteros means another of a different kind, and I'll give you more of the etymology of that word in a moment. Another but different kind. The other word for uh, another is alas. It's like this in the Greek. A-L-L-O-S and it means another of the same kind. The Galatians are being touted to a gospel of a different kind and as a result of this they are believing a gospel which is not another of the same kind of a gospel uh, turn with me for a moment keep your finger here we'll be coming right back to the book just before Galatians second Corinthians chapter in just a few pages. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, the Apostle Paul says uh, this. He says, for if someone comes to you. Now let's stop there and realize that there are four uh, kinds of if in the Greek. Uh, if has four conditions. A first class condition is if and it's true. The second class condition, if and it's not true. The third class condition is maybe it's true and maybe it isn't which is the only true if clause. And the fourth class condition is, uh, I wish it were true, but it is not. Every uh, conditional clause has two parts to it. The first part is called the protasis. The second part is called the apotasis. Now, the reason that you need to know this is because you, sometimes if some, one of these two is missing, it has to be supplied. Protasis, the part that says if, the apotasis, then. For example, if it rains is the protasis, then I will take my umbrella. I mean, simple as that. That's the simple illustration of the protasis and the apotasis of a first class, of a, of a conditional clause. In the first class condition, the statement that's made is not really an if clause. It's making a statement of fact or supposition. And that's what we have here, uh, if someone comes to you. This is a first-class condition, which is introduced by the particle A plus the indicative mood in the And that tells us that here is a, a condition which is true. Uh, and when he says, uh, he's saying, if indeed, uh, he's saying, uh, if uh, uh, absolutely, if definitely, uh, or uh, since they have come to you. So here is someone who is coming to, to the Corinthian church. Uh, if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the one we preached, and they are, that's how you translate first class condition. If someone comes and preaches another Jesus. Now we have an interesting statement here. He said, if they come and they preach another Jesus. Now, let me point out something here. Here we have the word alas. Another Jesus, another of the same kind of Jesus. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment, but I want you to read on with me. He explains that this same Jesus that they claim uh, is someone whom we did not proclaim, we being the Apostle Paul and his team. So, therefore, uh, and we'll use, the, we just write down here, proclaim. We did not proclaim. All right, now let's come back to that in a moment. Then, then he goes on to say, or, in other words, these indeed are coming, proclaiming. Now we have uh, something else. 
Then we have another spirit. This time it's the word heteros. So it's heteros or a different spirit. And the, the spirit, of course, that you did not receive. A different spirit that you did not receive is not the Holy Spirit, but it is obviously the spirit which comes from below. Or, he goes on to say, a uh, different gospel. We have the heteros again. Different. So we have different spirit, different gospel. But uh, uh, we, we have the same Jesus. But it's not the same Jesus that Paul proclaimed. What is he saying here? That these false teachers, are, they are proclaiming the historical Jesus, but they are retaking away from him his deity. They are taking away from him his finished work on the of Calvary. They are taking away from him the work uh, uh, that, uh, of, the, of grace. For the Corinthians, like the Galatians, readily accepted these false teachers. They had come in and they had proclaimed a, the, uh, historically the same Jesus, not, not as blank, and another spirit and another gospel. Therefore, they were false teachers. And these people had been readily accepted by the Corinthian church. And, beloved, it's amazing. It, I, can, I, I am amazed as I go through the New Testament. Uh, the Corinthians, the Colossians, the, uh, the Hebrews, uh, the uh, Peter writes to, to people, John writes uh, again and again and again, people receiving another gospel. A gospel is entirely different. A gospel is not really the gospel. But these teachers are coming out of the work at all times. And we've already noted about these, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, they are false apostles, they are deceitful workers, masquerading as the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Now, when Paul came, Paul came, as he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, did not come with excellency of speech, nor of inhuman wisdom. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter verse 1. Paul says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so the, object, the, the, uh, the saving work of Jesus based on the cross, which is not acceptable. We already know that it, uh, in verse chapter 1 that it, it's, uh, it's foolishness to this world and the world's system of, opera, of, of thinking. But he says, I came to you in, uh, in weakness and with fear and much trembling. And my speech was not a persuasive use of human wisdom, uh, but the proclamation uh, in, the, in the demonstration of, the, spirit, of the, the power of God, the Holy Spirit. So that, and here's the ultimate purpose, your faith, uh, uh, your doctrine that you believe might not rest on man's wisdom, but on the omnipotence of God. And here come uh, along the super apostles. Uh, they, we go, use that because Paul calls them that later on. And the super apostles come in to Corinth to follow along the apostle Paul. And they come and uh, they begin by, by criticizing Paul's message. Then they, uh, they uh, criticize Paul's delivery then they criticize Paul's appearance, so that by the time they're finished, the Apostle Paul, who had led them to know about who and what Jesus Christ is, he is considered a non-entity. And in so doing, they were building themselves up on tearing down the Apostle Paul. Mark it down. Anytime somebody has to use someone else to, to tear down someone else to build themselves up, don't even give them the time of day. They're, they're not worth listening to. Nobody can build their happiness on another person's unhappiness. Nobody can build a positive message on somebody else's negative message. That is not our message of, of negative towards someone else. But these super apostles were really something else. Look at what they did in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. These people came in and they did the, almost the unthinkable. Uh, Paul came, he didn't even take an offering. Paul received money from the Philippian church 
so that he wouldn't have to take an offering in that uh, congregation. Why? The same reason we don't take offerings around here. Because we don't want anything to be the issue except the grace of God. And if people want to give, they give according to their love for the Lord. But here these people, these super apostles came along. And what do they do? Verse 19 uh, of 2 uh, Corinthians 11. Paul says, you gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. Sanctified sarcasm. For those people who don't know that Bi the Bible uses sarcasm, uh, it's here in the Word of God. Sanctified sarcasm. If you gladly put up with fools since you are so wise, what he was really saying is, you're just as foolish as they are for putting up with them. In fact, verse 20 says, you even put up with anyone. Now please note what these super apostles were doing. First of all, they were enslaving the, the Corinthians. They enslave you. The second word is to exploit you. They exploit you. Uh, thirdly, take advantage of you. And uh, 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 fourthly, they push themselves forward. Uh, advance themselves. And fifthly, slap you in the face. Boy, I mean, that's really something. These people were so authoritarian that they had the they 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 and so first of all they brought about a whole group of of uh, laws and things to make slaves out of the people whom Paul had had given the gospel of freedom. If if the if Christ sets you free, you're free indeed. And Paul writes to the Galatians later on in chapter five, verse one, that uh, uh, they they for freedom Christ has set you free, not to become slaves. And yet, uh, there are multitudes, and I will be sharing with you a new book uh, that's out uh, uh, on, on some of the uh, uh, things that are happening in Christendom today, in fundamentalism, in, in evangelicalism, in the church, uh, and even in some of the cultism, that people are, uh, uh, teachers, false teachers are coming along and making slaves of people. Now, we all laugh when we talk about the, the Moonies, uh, who are uh, slaves of, of uh, Sun Young Moon, and they go out and they beg on street corners and are, are treated despicably while he lives in, 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 in great wealth. And yet, uh, what is the difference between that and some of the fundamentalism that, uh, and evangelicalism and charismatic movement that has gone on today, uh, i.e. Robert Tilton and others of his ilk? But not only do they enslave, but they exploit. They put their hand in their pocket. All they want to do is to pick the pocket of people uh, and get, their, uh, get a hold of their monies, uh, take advantage uh, of people, push themselves, advance themselves, and even go so far as to be so authoritarian that uh, they could slap the face of the, the, the believer in the congregation. This look at just the opposite of the way Paul was. And you'd say to yourself, well, how could these people accept these kind of teachers, false teachers, when it's in such contrast to the Apostle Paul, who in weakness and fear and trembling, preaching the gospel and only the gospel, would come to them? Why would they accept such things? Why would they go along with that? And yet, beloved, the same thing is happening today. By leaps and bounds, hundreds of thousands of people are being captured by false teachers who are teaching another gospel which is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is another gospel. Now when I was at Moody Bible Institute, we had to study a lot of the other cults and organizations, other religion. And uh, the reason was, uh, and we were told, so that we would be able to give to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's within you with fear and trembling or with uh, awe and reverence would be the, the correct translation. But I learned something from the United States government. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. When I was in Denver, Colorado, I, was, I took a tour of the Mint, the Denver Mint, and there I saw a, a bank of people. And these people were simply examining bills. And the guide, tour guide told us they were, what they were doing was they were looking for counterfeits. 
And one of the people asked, well, how do they prepare for this? Do they study every kind of a counterfeit that comes out? And they, the man said, absolutely not. They don't look at counterfeit bills. They study the original so that anything which is a deviation from the original, they spot in a moment. You don't have to spend your time studying Hare Krishna or anything else to be able to know that that's error. What you need to know is the truth. And the truth is contained only in the Word of God. Not by books about the Word of God, which I or anybody else have written. The Word of God is the canon or the criterion from which you get your doctrine. And if it doesn't measure up to the Word of God, it is not the canon. It is not the, uh, the correct. It is false teaching. And remember that it isn't those that are so vastly different from the canon. And canon simply comes from the Greek word meaning uh, ruler or measuring device. The ruler uh, by which uh, everything is measured. Uh, it isn't the one which is so different. It's to get as close to this as possible. That's the point of counterfeit. When Satan was in heaven, uh, Satan the, uh, and uh, Diablo, Sat Satan and Diablo, titles for Lucifer, what did he say? I'll be as much unlike God as possible? Of course not. He said, I will be like God. And his, his genius is that he can produce a counterfeit which is so much like the truth that it, it fools uh, the mo most of the people. Most of the people are fooled. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the counterfeit gospel, the counterfeit which is not the gospel, and it can't be, it cannot be the gospel, but it's a false uh, message purporting to be the gospel, but it is not the gospel. And, and of course, one of the things that uh, uh, we're so concerned about today is the principle of lordship salvation and uh, the Lordship salvation stands in the contrast to salvation by grace and this salvation for by grace stands for this grace alone by faith alone in Christ alone. Which means that anything which is added to grace, anything added to faith, anything added to Christ, destroys the message. There is no good works, no feeling, no submission, no remorse, no uh, feeling sorry for sins, no uh, making Christ Lord of our lives, none of these things is added to faith. It is faith plus faith alone, by grace and grace alone, which means that anything which is related to human merit or uh, of uh, doing good of any kind has to be rejected. And if it is in Christ plus anything, Christ plus the works of the law, Christ plus baptism, Christ plus uh, communion, plus uh, church membership, uh, Christ plus repentance, uh, Christ plus uh, anything, it is, it is wrong. And... Since works and faith are at an antithesis, and it is by grace through faith, it also produces a security for the believer which is not based upon anything he has done. The one who is saved remains forever saved and cannot under any circumstance or under any condition ever in any way lose that salvation. 
Now along comes uh, uh, some group today, and they take a look at some believers, and they say, hmm, these people are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are they? And the assertion is yes. But they are not living the life. They are not living the life. Now, the person who is looking at this has to make some sort of a conclusion. The first conclusion is this. I have to leave them with the Lord because I don't have any idea if they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ or not. I take them at their word. If they did, then they're saved. If they didn't, then they're lost. I leave them with the Lord. But there are those who will not do that. They will say, all right, they were never saved in the first place. And they were never saved because they did not make a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not make Christ Lord of their lives. If they had made Christ Lord of their lives, then He would be the Lord of their lives. They would live the life, which is not true, but that's what they say. Another group will say they have lost their salvation because if they really were saved, they would live the life. And uh, it would be obvious. But uh, that is not true. Uh, because uh, it does, we're not talking about fruit and whether a person bears fruit or not has no bearing upon whether or not they are actually born again. And in the book uh, on Galatians, I have uh, given uh, a reprinted article by Dr. Bob Wilkin uh, that is, talks about the differences within the grace view and the differences within the lordship camp of salvation Okay, and uh, you'll appreciate it. Dr. Bob Wilkin is the director, executive director of the Grace Evangelical Society, which is not a denomination. It's just a study society to which a number of people belong, uh, like myself, uh, who are committed to the grace uh, uh, view of salvation. Okay, in addition to that, in my book on salvation, which is available back in the uh, in the the uh, book rack and also available to you who are uh, watching by television or listening by radio if you ask for salvation we'll send it out to you and there is there are no uh, prices on any of our books everything is provided on a grace basis totally without charge but uh, the point is that uh, the uh, there's a, it's a perversion of the gospel of the grace of God and uh, uh, you see, uh, how is a person uh, actually saved? Uh, there's a lot of confusion uh, on this issue. Unfortunately, a lot of people have simply, simply followed what other people have done instead of they have actually studied the Word of God themselves. The, wor the Word of God makes it very clear that it's not by inviting Christ into your heart. Uh, Revelation 3.20 has nothing to do with salvation. That's a passage which deals with a believer out of fellowship and God's knocking at the heart's door is divine discipline for the believer to cause him to get back into fellowship. And he uses 1 John 1, 1.9 to confess his sins and gets back in. Uh, we have it very clearly stated in uh, John chapter 1, verse 12. As many as received him, to them gave he authority to become the children of God. Then he defines how what it means to receive. Uh, to as many as received him, to them he gave authority to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Uh, Acts, uh, very clearly, 1620, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Uh, Romans 4, uh, uh, 16 uh, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. All of these things are very, uh, and many more, clearly outline the fact that salvation comes by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And beloved, this excludes prayer. You don't pray to be saved. There's no prayer involved. It's what you, it's belief. 
It is an exhale of faith from your soul that God uh, in His omniscience recognizes. And when you uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God does 40 things for you and you don't feel one of them. They're all yours, but they're included in our little booklet entitled The Riches of His Grace. And God provides them for you. And they are absolutely free and postage paid when you've got them. And you don't pay for them before, during, or after. They're all yours by means of the character of God. Now, anybody that adds anything to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is perverting the gospel. Believe and raise your hand is perverting the gospel. It's muddying the issue. Now, I understand, because I have done it in the past myself, uh, in order for the person who is speaking to determine whether there are people who are saved in the audience, uh, he says, if you believe on the Lord, if you want prayer tonight, uh, raise your hand and I'll pray for you. But you see, whether you pray for that person or not doesn't have a bit, a bit of difference as far as their salvation is concerned. Because why? Because it's up to whether they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you say, I want to follow up on those people. And while that's a noble point to follow up on them, uh, and it's, it's a great idea, the point is this. God the Holy Spirit is much more powerful than you or I or any human being. And God the Holy Spirit is not going to be unfaithful to not follow up on the person who truly believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, or come forward. Uh, come forward. Why? So that uh, I can uh, uh, give you uh, uh, literature or pray with you or give you uh, counsel on how to be saved. Well, again, it's a very good uh, motivation, but it, it clouds the issue. It muddies the issue as what is salvation and what is salvation all about. Uh, believe and commit your life to Christ. No unbeliever can commit his life to Christ. Impossibility. But he's totally depraved. He's spiritually dead. He's spiritually brain dead. How can he commit himself to something he knows nothing about? Uh, uh, believe and repent. Uh, repent your sin. <laughs> you can't be sorry for your sins. And repentance doesn't mean that anyway. It means to change the mind. And you do change your mind from unbelief to belief. And so that's why Paul calls it a heteros. Heterosexual is a sex of a different kind. And heteros is uh, uh, one of a, a different kind. And uh, Dr. Wiest points out in his word studies a very beautiful uh, difference. He says, heteros denotes qualitative differences. Alas uh, gives numerical differences. Heteros distinguishes one of two. Alas adds one besides. Every heteros is alas, but not every alas is a heteros. Heteros involves the idea of difference of kind, while alas denotes simply distinction of individuals. Heteros sometimes refers not only to a different kind, but also speaks of the fact that the character of the thing is evil or bad. That is, the fact that something differs in kind from something else makes the thing to be of evil in character. When Paul speaks to the Galatians uh, of turning to a heteros gospel, he means, says Dr. Wiest, that they are not only turning to a gospel that is false in its doctrine, it is not only different in character from the gospel which he preached, but it is different in a bad sense. It is essentially evil. And then he goes on to point out that we really have a uh, contradiction of terms. For the gospel comes from this word in the Greek. It looks like this. Eu angelion. E-U-A-N-G. Two G's together sound like an N-G in the Greek. Eu angelion. Now this has, a, this has two words to it. The first is well or good in the preposition you, meaning well or good, and angelion, coming from the word angel, is message. In fact, you're going to see a mistranslation in just a few moments. When Paul says to the Galatians in Galatians 1, even though we are an angel from heaven, uh, preaches another gospel, that's wrong. Paul didn't believe that angels preached the gospel. 
And he knew that no angel from heaven is going to come, but they never translated the word angel. Where does the word angel come from? Where it mean? It simply means messenger. Angel means message, messenger. And so he says, though we are a messenger from heaven. Where does he get that? Well, when Paul first came to the Galatian area, you remember when he went to, to uh, 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 Lystra? That when he was at Lystra, what happened? We studied the book of Acts uh, when we were looking at the introduction. They thought Paul was Hermes, the great uh, uh, messenger of the gods, and that Apollos was Zeus, the major god. They were angels from heaven. That's what they thought. And suppose someone else of impressive character comes along. Uh, someone who is a spellbinder of a speaker. Someone who really knows what he's talking about. And the tendency would be for them to say, Oh, this man is from heaven. Paul says, look, if they come with a different message, they're not from heaven, they're from hell. I don't care if they look like they're a messenger from heaven. Or uh, suppose I come back again. And I preach to you a different gospel. Listen, folks, it's possible. It's possible for a man or a woman or a teacher to be uh, sound theologically at one moment and then, quote, later on somewhere along the line to, quote, see the light. I've had my eyes open. I now recognize that what I used to believe is not true, and so I don't believe it anymore. There's an organization called... Fundamentalists Anonymous. Did you know that? Fundamentalists Anonymous. That comes for people who were at one time fundamentalists who have turned apostate, given up, and they're now attacking fundamentalism and making fun of those of us who believe the fundamentals of the faith. And it's a very large organization, believe it or not. I have a very strong publication. Now, I don't have to read the publication to know what they're saying. It's easy to know what they believe. But here's the point. If you have you Angelion or a good message or good news, how can there be false good news? I mean, it's not possible. A message of good news is good news. A salvation by works message is not good news. That's bad news. That's terrible news. A salvation by works message is terrible news to a lost sinner who finds out that he's got to do something in order to be saved rather than simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 3.5, Paul said, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to what? His mercy he saves us. And what is mercy? It's grace in action. In addition, if salvation could be by good works, then who knows how many good works they have done and if they've done enough to earn their way to heaven. Can you ever know? Of course not. You would never have the assurance that you have given en done enough things to earn your way into heaven. Therefore, uh, Paul stamps the message of these Judaizers, these legalizers, as false doctrine and very clearly false doctrine. Now, the proponents of the gospel, the false gospel, the legalizers, had to call it the gospel. Now, I don't, I, it isn't true anymore, but uh, it used to be a joke among us a, a young men that, uh, you know, you want to go with a girl, you give her a gold ring. Trouble was, after two days, the ring turned, the finger turned green. Now, you, some of you don't have any idea what that means. It's so foreign to you. But you see, gold and brass look very much the same. But brass turns green after a while. And you can slip a ring on the gal's finger and it'll shine like gold. But after two days, the finger under the brass ring is green because it's not real gold. Brass is a cheap imitation of gold. It looks like gold. It purports to be gold, but taint necessarily so taint necessarily so. Uh, nowadays, what they do is they, they've learned how to do it. They plate uh, the brass with just enough gold so the finger won't turn green. And if you listen to the radio, I heard this week, get a gold wedding ring for 1995 in the mall. And I'm sure they had a line of people who were lined up there to get their gold wedding ring. 
Well, you know very well. It's just like they've had to change diamonds. Uh, you see, we, we used to talk in terms of uh, diamonds would be a uh, so many carats, uh, and that's a weight. Uh, I guess what are there are three different things: clarity, color, and carats uh, that you look for in a, in a diamond. Well, they don't. They talk about points. Uh, they talk about all kinds of other things because. Uh, to have a full carat diamond is so expensive, almost nobody wants could buy it. So they have to do other kinds of things. And they say they say this is a diamond, and it's a chip of a diamond. It's what they chipped to used to throw away. Now they make a, a, something out of it. And yeah, they, they, all ways of of, fo of phonying up the, uh, and making look as valuable as it really is. Now I don't know. I've never driven a Mercedes. But I have a feeling that there must be something about the way the Mercedes is engineered to make it worth twice what uh, a Lincoln costs. There has to be something, or they'd be off, they would soon be found out, like all other phonies. And I'm here to tell you, beloved, that the false teachers use gospel hymns, but they invest words with opposite meanings. They use scripture, but they pervert it to their own evil ends. They sound like genuine communicators of truth, but they're liars. They neutralize true believers who can't lose their salvation, but are involved in propagating the same heresy. Dr. C.I. Schofield, in his uh, little uh, booklet on Galatians, says, What is a simple child of God who knows no theology to do? Just this. Remember that any so-called gospel which is not pure, unadulterated grace, is another gospel. If it proposes under whatever spacious guise to win the favor of God by works or goodness or character or anything else that man can do, it is spurious. That is the unfailing test. Thank you, Dr. Schofield. You are right. Forget about the cultured, gentle, earnest, intellectual, broadly tolerant teacher who has a lot of uh, 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 degrees after his name and look to his message. What is he saying? Because the question is salvation is perfect, entire, eternal, and it is alone the work of Jesus Christ and the free gift of God on the basis of faith in Christ plus nothing. So the translation so far, we have Paul saying, I am absolutely amazed that you so readily, so rashly are defecting from the one who called you by the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. And then we're going to go on and study more about these false teachers in the next words which uh, come up in the second last part of the seventh verse and we'll take that in our next study thank you loving heavenly father for your matchless grace thank you for that which you have provided for us thank you that salvation is the free gift of a loving God on the basis of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary Help us to be always ready to measure every message by this truth and to reject that which is another of a different kind. I commit each person listening, watching, each one here to you, that they may be strengthened in the inner man by this study of doctrine this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.